Um, really, I'd just like to introduce you to technology from Sage to tell you what we're thinking in terms of our purpose, our strategy, um, remind you of some of our products and try to explain how we think they all connect together, um, and then share uh, what, uh, I'll borrow Emma's word, which I think was perfect, some provocations on some three big things that we're thinking about within technology from Sage and which we would love to get your thoughts on um, because these are trends that we see occurring uh, within our space and we want to be working with them and looking ahead to how our products can develop to support them. Uh, before I get into it, I just wanted to reiterate Amy's thanks to all of you for being here. Um, I know time is always our most precious resource, so to give up your time to come here means a great deal to us. And the most important thing for us in these next two days is the conversations we will all have with each other. And I hope that you will find the same. I know that in uh, previous um, iterations of this event, when we were just looking at the TALIS group, it was those library, librarian to librarian conversations which, which were the richest part of the event. So please do take those up and be curious, exactly as Emma said. Uh, so our purpose at Technology from Sage is to help libraries advance teaching, learning, and research. And uh, what we mean by that is we very deliberately put the library at the center of our strategy at Technology from Sage. So yes, we are focused on ultimately advancing teaching, learning, and research, and we connect there with our parent group, Sage's mission of building bridges to knowledge. That is what drives us as a company and what drives many of our staff, but we see our particular opportunity as helping libraries do that. We think that we have the biggest impact when we can provide tools that support the library in their own mission, which ultimately advances those three goals. And our strategy is to support the library in this shift that we see from collection-centric uh, services to patron-centric services. And I know this is something that many libraries have been doing for a number of years, um, but it's something that we see only accelerating over the next uh, several years, you know, five to 10 years. Um, and in that respect, uh, we would see ourselves within that, that, that view of the library that uh, Roger Schoenfeld and others have articulated, where it's not just what libraries hold, but who they serve. And we think that with the rise of open access, with some of these um, new trends around AI, the library focusing on how it supports its patrons and not just purely on its collection is going to be more important than ever before. And we're trying to position our products and the products that we develop and that we invest in in the future very much in that, uh, that space. Uh, so what are our products? So just a reminder, um, we like to see our products across the patron workflow. We find this a helpful way of seeing how they are ultimately part of this larger universe. And when you look at them in isolation, it might be hard to see the connection. But when you see them across the workflow, you can see how ultimately they are all addressing different parts of the same user's journey. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure this is not comprehensive. This is one of those classic uh, wheel type views that oversimplifies very complex, very different workflows from undergraduates to researchers to faculty. Um, but you can see here, I've overlaid on here, where our products sit. So first of all, uh, we have Talis Aspire. So of course, Talis Aspire is our reading list solution that supports guided discovery, that connects faculty with the library and both to undergraduates to bring their prescribed reading into their workflow and to do that in an easy to use, easy to engage way. Uh, then we have Talis Elevate which is our social annotation tool. And that's really about being in the learning experience with faculty and with undergraduates to help them work together annotating resources and to bring the library into that process as well. Because of course, this connects directly into the library's strategy around its resources and around ensuring the most uh, engagement with those. And even in areas like student retention as well. Uh, then we have Lean Library. Lean Library is our browser extension or application that sits in the patron's workflow and both helps them with their independent process of discovery and uh, research, but also brings the library into that workflow. 
And if you're not familiar with some of the, the Lean Library features, we've worked particularly hard in the last two years to bring library services like um, things like LibChat and, and LibGuides, thinking about Emma mentioning LibCal, that's next on our roadmap, to try and bring these services and tools that are often on the library website or on the library portal and take them to users when they need them. And last but very much not least, SciWill, which is an advanced authoring tool, uh, including reference management capabilities, and of course that's supporting the writing uh, element of the workflow. Um, so Daniel is going to, our product director, is going to speak later on about our product strategy and we'll go into more detail, but you can already see here where the gaps are and areas where we would like to focus, um, and we would love in the break your thoughts on this if you know, there are the key gaps you can see here as well. Uh, so the second uh, uh, piece I wanted to talk about was a little bit around provocations. It's three trends that we're thinking about at Technology from Sage. And as I say, for us, the big benefit of this event is to get to speak to you and to hear what you're working on, what your, uh, your big worries are, or your big opportunities. Uh, these are some of the things that, that we've been hearing from libraries um, and would love to check if they resonate with you. The first is disintermediation. So this is something that we've been talking about for many years. Um, Lean Library was really founded to address this particular challenge, um, where patron workflows nowadays do often bypass the library. They often begin outside the library. We know that uh, partly that is the rise of uh, Google and Google Scholar. Partly that is exacerbated by the pandemic and remote learning and so on. Um, we did a big report uh, two years ago, Librarian Futures, where we looked at this in detail. I've put up there one of our key findings around the discovery workflow. So this will be a statistic that is familiar with many of you, I'm sure, but we found that 80% of patrons start their discovery process outside the library. So they don't use the library's discovery tool, but they're often 50% or more are using Google Scholar, and others are going direct either through uh, social recommendations, even TikTok now, whatever it may be, they're going direct to content and they're often not starting at the library. Um, and this particular aspect of disintermediation is something that we really want our products to help address. We want to bring the library back to the user to show the value that the library can bring into their workflows. And for us also, we think of disintermediation not just about the workflow, but we've, all, we've also been interested over the last few years to see the rise of the research office, to see um, new initiatives at the university which sometimes are being championed by the library and sometimes sitting within the library's purview, but in others shifting to other departments. And so that, that for us connects back to our purpose. We want to help you make sure that the library evolves to continue to be a powerful force on campus and we think there are lots of areas where the library maybe has explored and is starting to engage with them but can continue to be the main leader. So I think AI, for example, is a classic one. I think the library there can really be the guide across the university on how it should be deploying AI and what the, the trade-offs and the risks might be. Uh, second is uh, three wordy words, um, infodemic, disinformation, and misinformation. But I think they're all connected. Um, and I think this particular trend we see really reinforcing the historic role of the library. So curation and information literacy, of course, always key to the library. I think that's going to be more mission critical for libraries than ever before. And if there are things that we can do to support that, um, I'm very keen to champion them. Uh, to give you a couple of examples of what I mean by those three different things, um, on the left-hand side, you see some findings from a study that we did with our friend's site, who are here uh, over the next few days, and also with Cambridge University, where we analysed patron reading habits that we were able to capture via the Lean Library browser extension. And we put those through the site citation index. And we saw that... Um, to look there, sorry. We saw that 13% of the academic content that had been read by those patrons had been contested by other academics in the field, or majority contested. And 
uh, almost 1,000 papers, uh, a very small percentage, but as a number, quite shocking, um, had been retracted or withdrawn by the publisher. And that's uh, at a very well-known established university in the UK with a lot of support from the library. Imagine what those figures are going to be like globally, particularly with the rise of AI. I saw um, something yesterday saying that there are already now published papers that are citing erroneous academic articles that don't exist that ChatGPT hallucinated and came up with on the fly. So clearly, this is an issue that we've already um, been facing for many years with predatory journals and, and other things, but it's only going to get worse, and the library can play a pivotal role. Um, alongside that issue around uh, misinformation and potentially disinformation, we also have the growth in academic output. So the academic output has grown by 53% over the last decade, and last year alone, over 3 million papers were published. And that's just papers. Uh, I'm not even counting preprints there, which are continuing to grow uh, very, very dramatically. And I saw Web of Science have just added uh, preprints to their index as well. So the library needs to be there to, of course, support patrons in curating this and in navigating to the quality content, to the content that they need. And then third, as Emma said, it's 2023 talk, so couldn't not mention artificial intelligence with all of its new capabilities, challenges, and the broader societal change that the library may not have control over but will be affected by. Um, I had a great debate with a colleague earlier uh, from our engineering team who knows a lot more about artificial intelligence than me. I'm not a technologist. Um, and he was questioning my, um, uh, he was questioning this idea basically, is it just emperor's new clothes? Should we really be taking it as urgently as we are right now? And um, I was making the argument as strong as I could that I, I really do think we should. I, again, I'm not a technologist, but I've tried to spend as much of my time as possible, as I'm sure you all have, in the last few months, trying to get a hold of it, reading as many experts as I can. And it feels like, until we know otherwise, we should take it incredibly seriously, and we should assume that it will have a transformative impact. Uh, in that respect, one of my favorite movies is Casablanca, and I like this quote that um, AI will transform everything, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of our lives. So there are lots of different predictions, whether you've got Bill Gates saying that we're going to see huge disruption to the workforce within the next one to two years, or others that say, hold, hold on, it's more like five to ten. Either way, this is going to happen within um, our lifetime and within a narrow enough window that we should be thinking about it now. Um, and because this conference is really about finding out what your perspectives are uh, on issues like this, and we have a particular session on uh, AI, a, a co-design workshop um, later on today, uh, I didn't want to assume anything about uh, the library. I thought I would just tell you what we're looking at at Technology from Sage as a business. Um, for me, the big thing is, a, is our duty of care to our staff. So we've just launched a, a three-month training program. And the idea is, is not that we can train up uh, anybody in three months. It's just to give an injection of cross-team focus to say, um, we know that some of you are already using AI regularly. Our software developers, for example, are using the Copilot tool that helps them auto-populate code. But in sales, in marketing, in product, in many other areas, we're not using it anywhere near as much. Um, and so this is designed to engage those teams so they, we can then work out what further department and function-specific training we need to provide. And I wonder whether there's something there, you know, we'll share our findings with our, our partners, as we always do, that might be um, of learning to other organizations, such as libraries as well. Um, we're looking at it, this, this program across four different areas. We're looking at business defensibility. I think you could maybe see a connection there to the library's uh, mission and the library's uh, contribution on campus as well. So from our perspective, we're thinking, what does this mean for uh, other competitors coming to the market much quickly now with AI? What should we be looking at um, long term? We're also looking at opportunities in our products. So are there new capabilities with AI that we should be using to come out with new products? Are there new challenges like plagiarism and the like that we could uh, help offer solutions to in our existing products or in new products? Uh, are there productivity improvements that could help the team focus 
on higher value contributions. So we, as every organization, have a lot of quite manual tasks. Maybe there's an opportunity here for us. And the third is team resilience. And I put some quotes there on the left-hand side, uh, the, the like of which I'm so sure you've already heard about for the librarian's role as well. But these are the kind of things that our colleagues are reading on a, a regular basis. That ChatGPT will replace programmers, that it's going to replace digital marketing, that it could be a new form of customer service, that it performs better than the average salesperson. So obviously these are uh, right now overblown and um, I'm sure long term are as well. But these are the kind of things that our members of staff are seeing on a regular basis. And I want to train them on engaging with AI so that we can show that actually these are not um, risks, it's not, um, it's not the end of those roles. If anything, AI can really help, help them succeed in those roles. So, with that bombshell, um, we're going to have some, uh, some questions now, and we've got a very fun uh, mic that we can throw around that is soft and padded, so you don't need to worry about getting hit or anything. Um, but we've got, uh, we've got about 10 minutes or so for questions before we move into the break uh, for either Emma or myself. Um, I'll go and sit down, and then Sufyan is going to hand out the mic to you. Any questions? This might seem a bit reactionary, but my question is, as you bring people into the library um, for events to get them to use the library more, does it suddenly become a space where you can't go and do your revision because of the noise? Thanks for the question. Um, so uh, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, there is, that, there is always that sort of um, uh, tension, isn't there? There's always that tension between um, is the library meeting the needs of ev everyone's learning start? So again, you could argue that you know, the, the students that had set up their chiropractic um, bench in the middle of the library, myself and a colleague, we did have a discussion. Have they actually stopped other learners from using the space over a period of time? Uh, probably, um, and I think that's where we will be having the conversations around, you know, are we actually, with academic colleagues, around that, do we need to curate space differently and better? Yeah, I mean, in a week, I think we, we have so many events and activities happening in the libraries, and sometimes people lose the library bit of that, they see the venue, um, so... I mean, interestingly, you could say we're here today, aren't we, in a theatre, and are, are any of us now going to go and visit the theatre following, you know, this conference? Well, actually, I, I probably will, because having a look round, you think, I should do this more, I should come here more often, and I wonder whether what it does do is it brings those learners in, and particularly academics in, to the space, and they get to see actually we're not what we were three years ago, two years ago, you know, one year ago. So I, I'm seeing it as this sort of positive relationship build, um, but notwithstanding, I'll wait for the NSS qualitative feedback and I'll come back to you and see whether it mentions any of it. But yeah, thanks for the question. I've seen two adverts for plays I want to see as well. <laughs> very strange um yeah just going on from that sort of space question um it's an interesting time at the moment i think for higher education um they're predicting student numbers are going to massively increase over the next few years um and that obviously puts pressures on space uh, in campuses um teaching space in particular um and i'm sure we're not the only libraries um having estates teams come around looking for space that they can nick for teaching space um and i guess what we need to know is how would you think that libraries can try and use this as an opportunity maybe to try and see if they can, because you know, spaces is probably going to be taken from them, but try and use that as an opportunity to then get students into the building as well after lectures and things like that. So just, yeah, if you've got any thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, so um, that's, that's a really a moot point. I'm sure many of us here, I, I know the project I led uh, several years ago where the bank moved in 
and, uh, and actually that was seen as a really good positive for the organisation. But actually, was it? Could, could that bank have gone somewhere else? And it's to do with footprint, isn't it? And it's to do with busyness. Um, what I would say to you all, you know, and again, you've all got your own experiences in this, is go and talk to people about the value of the work that you do and who is using you. And student voice has been really strong in helping us to not be defensive in that, um, but to actually have a really good conversation about the, again, equitable um, sort of access. You know, all students use us, all learners use us. We don't, we're one of the only locations on campus where people don't have to pay anything to be there. Um, they can be themselves. And we've done a lot of work around, again, monitoring use, so headcounts, UX. Um, we've done a lot of UX monitoring in, a, in, a, in a, one of our campuses that's it's an Ariba award-winning building 10 years ago. So it's now going through a refit. The library is at the heart of, of the building. Um, and it's a very valued space. And I did sit through many architectural meetings where the cafe really should go there. Wouldn't that be a great place for a cafe? <laughs> and you thought, you know, I love uh, coffee, but it was like, I, I'm quite happy to go and walk downstairs to go and get my coffee, because actually the library space, once it's gone, it, it has gone. But what we've uh, sort of negotiated is the student union will now have a presence in there, uh, but more from a sort of consultation and uh, facilitation with students. The library is the heart of that space and has been called that on the plans. Um, and the, uh, what was going to be a cafe will now be converted into one-to-one -one and group bookable uh, teaching and training rooms. We'll then have the bun fight over who's actually sitting in them and using them. But actually, I think it's, it's okay to be robust. It's okay to go back. And it's okay to actually use, uh, and again, the co-creation and, and the sort of other voice is to work with, I would suggest, students, particularly in the value of the work that you do and the service that you offer. And I've found sometimes the student voice is stronger than mine or any of my colleagues. Good luck with it. Any other questions? Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, actually? sure. Sorry, well. face you. Um, yeah, I was just interested, um, when you're speaking with university leadership, mm. um, what are the KPIs that they would measure the library against? Is there a sort of annual review there? They would say, you know, you've you performed well, and what would they be focused on? Shall I use that? So thank you, Matt. So that's a really good question. So um, thank you for it, actually. I report to a Deputy Vice-Chancellor. So I report in, I'm a member of the senior leadership team. Um, and that's quite a crowded space. Um, we have lots of people, um, estates, IT, registry. There's lots of big, uh, personalities, lots of big conversations. So the metrics that library traditionally was held to account for and was celebrated or commiserated on was primarily a KPI around national uh, student survey satisfaction with libraries. So many of us in the room will know that as formally as question 19. Um, and it was that very sort of basic, did the you know, library meet your needs? Um, and we would have these league table reports every year, both to Wales, to sector, and to the UK, and we'd be scrutinising them, and, and Larry and Rachel will remember these, you know, lots and lots of meetings, learning teaching committee. I'm proud to say we're out of that sort of minutiae and in the weeds, and what we've done is we've been able to articulate um, the library's role and the learning journey role in, in all of the metrics. So we have metrics around recruitment. So um, our critical success factor one is around recruitment and applications. So we are a venue for open days and part of the student experience on those. And then it goes all the way through into uh, retention, um, attraction, retention, progression, achievement, so good honours, two, one and a first. Um, and then we've got sort of CSF sort of um, five, which is uh, graduate employability, which I have responsibility for, and also then um, entrepreneurship. We then have one on seven, which is financial um, uh, sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, resilience um, and again we evidence through supply chain our value for money and return on investment. So what I'd encourage you to do is find out what your metrics are and then apply your thinking to how you meet every single one of those and where you're not, why not? So we've had um, great NSS, we've had middling NSS and what we've been able to demonstrate is why. 
And quite often it's about um, that sort of link to insufficiency. We're not doing enough, we should be doing more. But actually what it's often about is someone, if they've had a poor experience at the university, you'll see the qualitative feedback will be extensive and library may be mentioned because it's another thing that didn't quite work for that learner. It's the, the, the learner's expectations were not met, their needs were not met. And so I take that as a kind of opportunity to sort of really scrutinise, okay, what, and again, it's the who isn't there, sort of who isn't engaging with you. And as, as you've indicated in your um, talk, you know, there's some really thought, you know, provoking points there around we're part of this change now. And it gives the library and the librarian an opportunity to be at the heart of that. Um, and the metrics and the evidence just give you um, the sort of information and the, and the power, really, to know where to put your arguments and where to put your um, commendations. So speaking at top table, I would say people want you to be an expert in your field, but I found you get a lot further if you can speak to a range of what's important for your executive. So otherwise, you can just get a bit boxed in. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We've got to go to break, I'm afraid. That's good. So I didn't think I, should I just say that? <laughs> um, please, please go to the break. Lots of coffee and goodies there. So see you later. Yeah, Thank you very much. Everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.